Mr. Shapiro, thank you for joining us today. I, I think it is important that you're here um, as one of the leading conservative voices in the country. And, and the country has, in the last couple of weeks, talked a lot about and Googled uh, prog Project 2025. It's one of the most Googled uh, search terms right now. And uh, you're not going to get any censorship from me. So uh, I just wanted to know, from your perspective, I think it would help us understand on just like a scale of zero to 100 percent, how much do you support Project 2025? I think like President Trump, I haven't looked all that deeply at Project 2025, but it seems that Democrats on this committee, sort of like Peter Pan and Tinkerbell, uh, if they say Project 2025 enough, their presidential candidate becomes alive again. <laughs> and so, well, let's just talk about pieces of it. And you, I guess you can tell me if you support it. Um, you probably want less bureaucracy, right? I do. I want less bureaucracy. You want more efficiency? I do. I want less effic more efficiency. You want taxpayer money spent wisely? I do. Congrats on becoming a Republican. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My parents would be proud. Um, <laughs> mass deportations, it calls for that. Do you support that part? I support the deportation of any illegal immigrant who is in the United States who is not of benefit to the generalized American public. So if they're uh, picking agriculture that puts food on the tables of everyday Americans, they've never committed a crime inside the United States, they didn't come across with documents, should they be deported? If they have not paid taxes and if their draw on the taxpayer benefits are larger than the contribution they are making to the economy or if they're involved in criminal activity, they should be deported. How do we measure that? The same way that the IRS measures my income every year. It seems like if the IRS can track down every aspect of every receipt that I've ever submitted, and so they if can they do were so for hundreds of millions of other Americans, they can do that for illegal immigrants as well, except for the fact that no one knows how many are in the country thanks to this administration. So you would be cool with creating a system where they could pay those taxes if they wanted to and then stay and work and put food on our table? Uh, it depends on how long it would take for them to pay the taxes, and they would also have to go presumably to the back of the line, although I'm not sure why I'm testifying about immigration policy at this point. How about banning the abortion pill? That's part of Project 2025. Do you support that part? I think that that's a state-by-state state issue on a personal level. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just asking you. Uh, I'm, sure. I'm, 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 I'm a fully pro-life person, which means that I'm not in favor of the distribution of the abortion pill. Banning same-sex marriage. What about that part? I am in favor of traditional marriage between a man and a woman, and I am perfectly fine with anyone having any sort of voluntary sexual arrangement they seek. That's a different thing from whether the government should attach benefits to that personal relationship. But you think it's a sin to have same-sex marriage? I mean, I'm, I'm confused. Are you asking me as a religious Jew what I think about biblically? I'm just here? asking, is it a sin to be gay? Is it a sin to be gay? I mean, we, are, how long do we have here? Two minutes? I mean, if, if, the, if the basic idea is that sexual orientation is up for government regulation, I'm not in favor of the government regulating the private consenting sexual activity of adults. That is a different thing, once again, from whether the government ought to engage in actual benefits for particular sexual arrangements that adults make. But again, just you, you to me, is it a sin or not? From a religious Jewish perspective, orientation is not a sin, but activity is. That's also the same perspective of most major religions, so far as I'm aware. Okay. And, and how about cutting Social Security? Do you support that part of 2025? I'm, I'm not sure what Project 2025, 2025's position on Social Security is. I'm, I'm in favor of the restructuring of Social Security along the lines of privatization and lowering and, and increasing the retirement age because you, as well as every other congressperson, knows Social Security is going to go bankrupt, and yet everyone seems to have an interest in lying about it for the next decade and a half until we have to take austerity measures or radically increase inflation or taxes. And, and bans against uh, books about slavery, do you support that part about why would I possibly be in favor of bans about books about slavery? That, that would be absolutely ridiculous. What I am in favor of is the idea that school libraries should be able to make decisions along the lines of what exactly is appropriate for, say, a seventh grader and whether they ought to be treated to cartoons and gender queer. That's not quite the same thing. And, and just because we found some receipts, you did say, I think homosexual activity is a sin. Yes, I'm a religious I'm Jew. Sure that's true. sure there's a genetic component you to found me out. orientation. But the view of all religious people I know has always been that sexual behavior is something that is up to you. And you said, I may have a desire to sleep with many women, but I uh, do not. I agree with me. Yes, that's true. Um, congratulations on your, yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's very hard to restrain um, yourself. Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, shift to um, Alvin Bragg. Uh, he was supposed to be here uh, this week, and he's not coming. And Hunter Biden was supposed to testify. Now he's not testifying. We were supposed to have votes on articles of impeachment, and, and we didn't. And 
again, we're just wondering, you guys write great press releases, uh, but the payoff uh, seems to never come. And so I guess we will uh, keep waiting and, and we'll do hearings like this. And Gentlemen, finally, Chairman, you know, you can, you can yell, you cannot yell fire in a crowded theater, but, and that's a restriction on speech as you have recognized before, uh, but you can yell theater in a crowded fire and, and you all can continue to do that uh, all you want, and we'll just waste the American people's time. Gentlemen's time time has expired, and I remind him of the first rule of holes. When you're in one, stop digging. Mr. Patel, are you part of an organization that uses market power for censorship? No, sir. And how much advertising capital do you deploy annually? How much marketing investment do we spend? Yeah. Uh, $850 million a year. And you spend, you said, less than 1% of that in the news area, right? Yes, sir. And that's because, really, your brands don't want to be involved in these caustic news disputes or political disputes. They want to be apolitical in the presentation of their brand. That's your, is it my understanding that testimony correctly? So we, we serve 90% of American households with our portfolio. It's a fascinating answer, just not to my question. Is the reason you de-emphasize news because you want to be apolitical. We target our investment to address the consumers that buy our brands. Okay, are you doing so for political reasons or apolitical reasons? We don't do it for any political reason. Okay, so then why are the vice presidents of your company trying to shape the way Facebook limits view of a Trump advertisement? So I'm not sure what the intention of that communication was. but that's I do. Not... It was to get the Trump ad taken down. It's pretty clear. You had two vice presidents, Rob Master and Luis Tacomo, who were pressuring Facebook to, to utilize Facebook's policies to take down a Trump ad. So it's, it's just hard to believe that your goal is to avoid politics when, the, like, not some intern at your company, but the vice presidents at, your, at Unilever are writing Facebook saying, we want you to take this Trump ad down and apply these policies to do it. So I'm not sure what the intention of communication was. But okay, that's, I, I'll that's... tell you what, I'll read you the communication. It's two words. It's, for, it's, it's your vice president, to Garm when they were trying to get the Facebook ad taken out. It said, honestly reprehensible. So you, you're, you're using this $800 million plus power that you have over the marketplace, Facebook is craving your advertising dollars, and you have two vice presidents hammering Facebook to take down a Trump ad about whether or not Joe Biden should have his ear inspected for an earpiece. That was what the ad was about, that you all found so reprehensible. So, so respectfully, uh, I'm not sure that word was done by a Unilever person. You're, you're, okay, so Mr. DeComo didn't work for Unilever? He, he sits on the... If I, if I did my homework right, I think that came from um, the GARM, uh, Rob. Oh, Rob Rankowitz, yes. yes. And, and you're, you, but you are member entities to GARM. You pay GARM. You guys are GARM. I mean, as Mr. Jewell said, you guys have, got, you have to have tools in order to help you place your ads. So you go fund GARM, and then here your, executive, your vice presidents are commiserating with GARM over the fact that Facebook won't remove this. I guess, Mr. Shapiro, when, you, when we look at these big advertising platforms and they're here they're hearing the people with the advertising dollars hammer them with this ideological tilt what does what what does that do to the marketplace for ideas obviously it shuts down the marketplace of ideas which is largely the intent and one of the things that i've heard from some of the democratic members of the committee today is an extraordinary amount of projection Projection wherein they suggest that Republican members of the committee are trying to shut down free speech by trying to get answers to questions about the kind of political pressures that are being put on social media companies, for example. But it's been Democrats who for years have been spending their time trying to pressure social media companies into doing their bidding by limiting the types of information that are available to the public and how that information is actually distributed. One of the things that, that's worth noting here is that it's not just a matter of advertising dollars flowing. The way that it works on social media is that if you are demonetized, then the reach of your actual content is also limited by the same social media companies. Do you think the frequency of those demonetization rises when you have vice presidents of companies at Unilever trying to hammer entities like Facebook into taking down Trump ads. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. There is no question that when you have internal pressures put on social media companies to take down right-wing material, that that has an impact on the reach of right-wing messaging. There's yeah. just no question. And I guess I don't mind when Democrats say they don't like conservative speech or we get to say we don't like some of their speech. That's how this works. But it's when, when the business community colludes and utilizes market power to shape the way social media companies or websites disseminate information that the public doesn't even get to see that that debate and engage it. And I think the fact that it's clandestine is actually even more corrosive to the values that undergird. That's absolutely true. The complete lack of transparency with which Garm treats both the member companies as well as the consuming public is one of the major problems. If they simply wish to levy a boycott against a right-wing source, they should simply say that's what they're doing. Hiding behind fake standards in order to project objectivity is a major problem in transparency for the market.